the November 12th, 3 o'clock Special Committee and Police and Community um, Committee. Um, I'm Councilwoman Ortiz, I chair, I'm the chair, um, and I want to apologize for not being there in person, but I'm still coughing and I just want to be cautious. I don't want our interim police chief to get sick. So if my other two council members would um, introduce yourself, um, that would be great. Karen Hiller, District 1. <coughs> Deputy Mayor Mike Padilla, District 5. Thank you, council members. Um, so we've called the meeting to order. Next, um, next thing on the agenda is approve the minutes from August 27th. Move to approve. Second. <clears throat> it's been moved and second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Three zero. Oh. Okay. Next, we'll have a presentation by the. Uh, is it Kansas C Post training and certificate certification process? And I will turn it over to Interim Chief Wheelis. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman. Ye yes, it is. It it's actually, so we get it all correct for, for those that are viewing us in public. It's the Kansas Commission on Peace Officer Standards and Training. Um, and we have, we're, we're very fortunate today to have with us the, uh, the new director. And I say new, although August of uh, 2021, it's been a little bit of time at this point, uh, Doug Schrader. Uh, a little bit of background on him um, before we move through the rest of the processes. He was a uh, chief of police in Heston, Kansas for 20 years before being selected to take on his new role as C-Post. He has a bachelor's degree from Central Christian College and a graduate degree from Fort Hayes State University. He's also an adjunct professor, professor in several Kansas colleges. Um, Doug, Doug has been around for a while and is a very known quantity among the uh, law enforcement community here in the state of Kansas. He's a past president for the Kansas Association of Chiefs of Police as well. Um, but this, this next part I want to put a little emphasis on, and I know he would, never, he would never say these kind of things about himself because he's that kind of humble guy, but he is also among various national, state, and local award winners. He has received the Presidential Medal of Valor from the United States President, and that was specifically due to his, and I'll use the term, heroic role in an active shooter situation in his jurisdiction. So um, I only say that, one, to, to somewhat embarrass him, uh, but two, because I think it's worthy of mention to this committee and to the public so they understand uh, where he comes from, but also that he's not just an academic. He's been a uh, law enforcement officer for a very long time, and I won't... Uh, I won't dwell any more on that because I know he would not like me to. So Thank we'll you. move forward. But he's accompanied by his uh, assistant uh, administrative director there at uh, C-Post. And, and for the purposes of this, I think we'll all just say Kansas C-Post because it's just a little easier than the rest of that. But she's been a member of that agency for a period of time um, since 2016. She began her legal career in Pittsburgh, Kansas in 2002. And uh, she was a city prosecutor for Wichita in 2007. Um, she has a Bachelor of Arts in English and Psychology from KU, and she, uh, she graduated with a law degree from the uh, University of Kansas Law School as well. One of the big things that uh, Michelle has done was she, is the, she would developed and uh, implemented the first mental health court in the state of Kansas. <clears throat> and she, she is, what's that? Yes, she did. I remember that. <laughs> and, and so she, she is, and she's not going to, she's a humble person too, so she would never say this, but she's a recognized expert in that area um, and has long been a benefit to the law enforcement community in the state of Kansas. So having said all of that, um, I, am, I reached out to them after seeing a presentation that Doug made uh, to the Chief of Police Association, and he opened the door uh, saying that he would be willing to, to come to various communities and talk to them about Kansas Seaposts. So I'm, I'm very glad that both of them are here, and I consider them to be uh, experts in, uh, and colleagues, and so I just wanted to give them the introduction that I felt like they deserved. Well, I appreciate that, Doug and Michelle. Welcome. I know when... Um, our one of our um, multiple judge, multiple court judges, he went down and he watched how she ran it. So we're very pleased to have both of you there. I wish I was there. I would get in trouble because I'd give you a hug. But welcome to Topeka and take it away and take your time. 
Very good. Thank you so much for having us. As we pull up our, our PowerPoint, uh, I, I just, uh, again, I, I thank you. It is an intentional effort of ours at The Post to do more of this, more community interaction. Um, a lot of people uh, don't understand what The Post does, and so an educational opportunity when, it's, uh, when we're invited, we're, we certainly take, uh, take full advantage of that. All right, let's talk about what The Kansas Post is. It is, uh, first and foremost, a, regu a regulatory agency. Um, it is a state department, and uh, it regulates the licenses of police officers. Our authority comes from the, the CLETA, or KSA uh, 745601. Uh, we... we we deal with officer uh, certifications and licensing in that we both issue them and uh, we have the power to uh, revoke and actually five different actions that we'll, we'll get to uh, here pretty soon. Uh, we serve as a resource to prevent uh, what uh, a lot of folks call the wandering officer. Uh, I'm sure a lot of our, our listeners and folks in this room um, have had the um, experience of hiring and uh, coaching and, and probably, uh, unfortunately, the experience of, of firing employees. Um, what you, uh, if you've had that experience, what you uh, typically know is it's not always what's in the resume or in the application, but it's what's omitted from the application, right? Right? So if an officer were to um, be hired somewhere and uh, because of bad uh, decisions, they get fired and move to the next one, but they choose not to remember or disclose that they had once worked somewhere, um, our, uh, our authority allows us to track their employment and uh, provide that to um, departments that are checking into that. So um, we can prevent the wandering officer uh, here in, in Kansas. Um, again, we, we take uh, uh, certification actions as deemed appropriate. We'll talk about the five different kinds of actions that the post uh, can take. Uh, but I think it's just as important to know not only what is C-Post, but what, it, it, what C-Post is not. Trying to further on my outsider range here. Thank you. Oh, there we go. Uh, so what we are not, we do not conduct criminal investigations of any sort. Those are left for uh, criminal investigators and the courts to, <coughs> to remedy. Uh, we also do not conduct interagency internal affairs investigations. So if, an, uh, if a department came to us and asked us to look into policy violations or something like that for them, that's not a service that we provide. Um, that's up to that agency. And should they seek outside assistance, um, like a lot of them do, that's, of course, um, you know, one of, one of the things uh, that, that's pretty common, actually. Um, but that doesn't involve us. Uh, we do not substantiate allegations. And this, uh, this is kind of hard for um, some folks to, to realize. We investigate actions that could be a result, could result in certification action uh, because of violations of the uh, Kansas Training Act. But at the end of that investigation, we don't substantiate or unsubstantiate that claim. And we'll, we'll work through the, uh, the process, really the form uh, of what an investigation looks like from beginning till end so that, so that your listeners have a good understanding of that. Um, we, do, uh, we do not exercise authority over non-certified law enforcement officers. So typically, uh, jailers or detention officers that work for a sheriff's department uh, generally are not going to be certified officers, so we don't have authority to investigate wrongdoing on their part. Um, Department of, of Corrections employees um, fall into that same thing. They aren't certified law enforcement officers. And then also auxiliary personnel. A lot of agencies call them reserve officers. It's, it's, it's popular in smaller towns where they may have a, a once a year festival or um, Friday night security needed at the, at the football game type thing where they bring those folks in and, and hopefully train them up. But uh, since they aren't licensed, since they don't attend a, uh, an academy in Kansas, uh, they don't fall under our authority. Another example of uh, auxiliary personnel would be, and, and I'm sure the, the city of Topeka has um, chaplains, either paid or unpaid, um, but those folks are not sworn officers, so they are not under our uh, authority as well. 
um, we do not exercise authority over law enforcement agencies. Um, for example, if we get a complaint that um, so and so city police department, they're all corrupt and, and they do thing, you know, they do uh, immoral things. Um, we don't uh, look into that agency if they have individual officers with certifications and there's a, a alleged wrongdoing, then that is something we do uh, look into. But we do not take any actions on law enforcement agencies, just on law enforcement officers. And we uh, exercise uh, that authority over uh, the judicial uh, system, uh, meaning that um, the complaints that come in um, uh, on officers or the courts or um, officers of the courts does not fall under our authority as well. Um, our commission is made up of 12 members. Uh, the 12 members in the commission are um, all designated by statute 745606. They comprise of the superintendent of the highway patrol, uh, the director of the KBI, and uh, three um, members of uh, three sheriffs that the Kansas Sheriff's Association has uh, forwarded their names to us. Those three sheriffs are from varying size uh, of counties. Uh, so Sher Sheriff uh, from Saline County, uh, Sheriff Solden, uh, Sheriff Herrig from Jefferson uh, County, and then also Sheriff uh, Presley from Graham County are the three sheriffs that are on the uh, commission. Uh, similarly, we have three police chiefs on the commission, and they are made up of class one, two, and three cities. And we have um, uh, Police Chief Don Scheibler from Hayes, and Police Chief Jeffrey Hooper from Hutchinson, and also Chief Bauer from Lewisburg, uh, police department. Our commission is made up of one member representing the police academies in Kansas, and that member right now is Major Jody Prothy uh, from Johnson County. It is made up of a uh, person from the Fraternal Order of Police Lodge, and that is uh, Detective Mark Bundy. Uh, we also have a representative from the Kansas County uh, uh, District County Attorneys Association, uh, Sherry Shuck. And then also by statute, our chair is not law enforcement related. Uh, our chair is uh, Brandon Johnson. Uh, he is also a city commissioner for the city of Wichita. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the history of Seapost. And I think that that's important because as um, as the nation engages in some conversations about police reform, which are important and necessary, uh, it's it's important to compare apples to apples. And because every state has a different system by which they regulate law enforcement officers, um, we can't really do that. So we wanted to make sure that you understand sort of what all we do. And in a little bit, we'll talk about what some other states are doing so that you can kind of get a better sense of, of how we compare or, or kind of what's going on. So when you have those... Um, conversations about police reform, you know what we're currently doing. So the regulation of law enforcement started in 1968, and that's when the Kansas Law Enforcement Training Act was created. And then it was in 1983 that uh, they began the certification program where they issued a certification in order to be a law enforcement officer, and at the same time have the authority to be able to suspend, revoke, or deny law enforcement certifications. We have a few more, few more actions that we do now, and I'll go into those a little bit later. Um, in 1992, we before 92, um, agencies only had to tell us when they hired someone. They didn't have to tell us when an officer left. And so again, when we talk about the wandering officer that Director Schrader mentioned, it's important to know if, if you have someone that's engaging in misconduct at agency, agency to agency. And so starting to track when they left an agency was important and it allowed us to capture that employment history for the officer. In 1995, we added um, diversions to disqualifying convictions. So at that time, um, you, had to ha you essentially had to have a, conv a conviction for a felony crime or a misdemeanor domestic battery. And what we were seeing is that many times in the judicial process that would get um, handled by diversion and that's typically not considered a, that's not considered a conviction in, in other areas of the law um, there's a few exceptions but so it's specifically written into our definition section that a conviction includes a diversion and in 98 or I, actually it was a little bit later um, 
later we we also included um, deferred judgments, which are very similar to a, a diversion. So again, we're wanting we we've always been active in kind of closing up those loopholes to if there's a trend where we're seeing. Um, the officers that would, you know, other, otherwise be disciplined. There's areas, you know, that some some were kind of escaping that. We kind of want to make sure that that's consistent. Um, and so in 97, the misdemeanor crime of domestic violence would add, was added. In 98, we began posting all of our orders. And so we'll talk later about transparency, but that's when um, it was recognized that the public needs to know who, what officers are being disciplined, and we list the agency from which they're disciplined as well, or, or basically the agency where the, the misconduct occurred. So a lot of times they have separated from employment or they've been fired, but, but we kind of list where they were an officer at that time. In 2004, um, that's where we added the statutory language that addresses the wandering officer. So the, we created the central registry, and that's meant to be a resource for law enforcement agencies to determine where that officer has been and, and what they did there. Um, we consider ourselves a pointer system. So we have a form that agencies that must submit and give us the circumstances of why the officer separated. Um, and then there's a, a number of instances if there was any sort of investigation that was going on, they have to give us a narrative. And then a potential hiring agency is is able to get that form and then they can go to the agency if they need a little bit more information about what happened. Um, an important thing to note on that is that statute does release the agency head from liability for what they disclose on that form. Um, in 2006, uh, C-Post was created in its current form. So prior to that, all of the action that I've talked to up until now was just under the um, Kansas Law Enforcement Training Center. It was all the conduct happened, but it, it wasn't under C-Post. And so in 2006, that there was kind of a notion that, um, you know, KLATC is responsible for training and C-Post, the regulation maybe needed to be separate again to just kind of aid in that appearance of um, independence and transparency. Um, when you look at other states, there are certainly other states that have the same models as, as us, but there's also states that have um, both under one roof. And so in 2012, this is a really kind of a banner year for C-Post. Um, as I mentioned, prior to 2012, the only conduct we could take um, action on was the felony convictions and the misdemeanor crimes of domestic violence. Um, in 2012, the commissioners sort of of their own volition decided, you know, there needs there, there's a lot of conduct that's not covered that needs to be actionable. And so it was a pretty lengthy process and a, a very broad statutory undertaking in order to um, expand that conduct. And so at that time, the ability, we don't have to have a conviction anymore. We can, we can um, take action on the conduct alone. And that's important because really throughout the state, you see there's just differences in, in what gets referred for prosecution and what prosecutors are willing to take. Um, you know, you have some prosecutors that, for example, one told me once, well, I just don't charge domestic violence if it's a, a sibling case. And, you know, they, they have some discretion to make those decisions. But when you have one county over that does charge those, you need to be uniform in what we're, what we're taking action on. And so that was important. And also it allowed for any sorts of what we'd see a lot was that you'd have a felony charged and then that would get um, amended down to a misdemeanor. And so that took it out, out of the scope of what we could take action on. And so, again, that was uh, the commissioners taking an active role in making sure they could take action where they felt appropriate. So there were 58 misdemeanors that were added um, that were allowed to take action on. And it's most, I mean, that covers most of the misdemeanors, most of the conduct that you think of when you think of a misdemeanor. Um, and we can certainly, we'll talk about our website later, and all of those are listed on the website if you're interested. Uh, we also added unprofessional conduct, and then that's defined. It's 14 different um, actions. So that's, that's where we get the authority to take action on excessive use of force, um, a false statement in, in an official communication, or then if an officer is exploiting his position to gain something of value or try to... Um, establish a relationship with someone, um, we can take action on those types of, um, of conduct as well. And then also in that first bullet point, um, in 2011, um, the bias-based policing statute, as it's written now, was adopted. And so then that next year, we had to add that into the conduct that we could take action on. Um, 2014, we began posting our integrity bulletin on online, and that has a synopsis of, it's kind of the cliff's notes of what the officers are doing. On that version, we take out the officer's name and the agency because we really, the, the 
audience there is we want law enforcement officers to read that and see what kind of conduct is actionable. But it is, I mean, it's the, the public at large is welcome to get on there and, and look at the conduct as well. Um, and then in 2017, we, um, again, I mentioned this earlier, we added deferred judgments just to close one of those loopholes. In 2018, the associations, which is the Sheriff's Association, the Chiefs of Police, and the Peace Officers Association, they lobbied for a statute that allows them to get the, the records from the agency. So I mentioned that we're a pointer system, and so you get the one, you know, the, the one narrative paragraph that kind of says what happened, but, you know, an agency that's doing their due diligence to, to actually look into that conduct and make some decisions, they, get, they need the personnel record. And so um, there were some agencies that, um, you know, at the direction of their legal counsel said, well, we're not going to give you that. We're only going to tell you when they were hired, when they left, and, you know, if they're rehirable. And so this was the associations making sure that agencies can make informed decisions about their hires. And so that, again, addresses that wandering officer um, notion. In 2020, um, we began actually posting the certification orders online. And so it's not before you get the little synopsis, but now it, it, we obviously 2020 was a, a year where there's a lot of conversation about transparency. And we felt it was important to take a step a further step in that direction as well. And so we, we post the orders. Um, the only thing I redact on those are, um, you know, that officer's personal, uh, personal address or any medical records will redact that consistent with the Open Records Act. So if you have an interest in getting on and, and re reading all the legalese, you're certainly welcome to do that. Um, in 2021, we've got some new tracking uh, software, and so we'll be able to give better data moving forward on what kind of cases we're taking action on and what those look like, where in the state those happen. Um, we also, um, we're here today because we're, we're wanting to get out and um, do some more ed outreach and education. We think it's important that, you know, the communities understand what we're doing, why, why we're doing it, and what we have authority to do, basically. Um, we are looking at some legislation to make that record check mandatory. So when the, right now, an agency is not required to get our records, but the, our commissioners kind of think that they should be. Um, everybody should be doing their due diligence. So that's something that we may be looking at in, down the road. Um, it's kind of important to understand what makes up a law enforcement officer in Kansas. And sometimes the language is a little bit confusing because we have the, the word commission in our title, but we don't actually commission officers. So in Kansas, in order to be a law enforcement officer, you have to have your certification, which we issue. And there's some minimum requirements that are um, that an, an applicant has to meet. And Director Schrader is going to go over those in just a moment. Um, and then also you have to be trained. You have to go through a, a basic academy. And that, that's either at the main KLATC campus in um, Yoder or near Hutchinson, or there's a few satellite academies that get their um, authority to to conduct their academy, Topeka has one, and they get that through the Law Enforcement Training Academy. So when you have both of those things, you also have to be hired by a law enforcement agency in order to get the certification through us. And the agency is the one that gives the officer their commission. So they're, they're the ones that say, you have authority to act as an officer within our jurisdiction. Um, and so that's what's required to be a law enforcement officer in Kansas. Oh, I went too far. That's right. Uh, yeah, so minimum uh, qualifications for a police officer in Kansas is, st is set by statute 745605. Uh, currently, uh, you have to be a United States citizen to be a police officer in Kansas. That is uh, under some scrutiny, really, right now. And there are six, I believe it's six, six or eight other states that allow folks that are in the process of gaining citizenship uh, the ability to be a, a police officer, because what we, what we know is that could take years. Uh, um, we value diversity, so Kansas law enforcement is really looking at that. But it, it would take a statute change from how it, how it uh, currently is. Uh, they are also, minimum qualifications also include a fingerprint background check, uh, high school uh, graduate, graduate or equivalency. And again, we're talking minimum uh, qualifications. Uh, they must be free of physical or mental condition which impacts their ability to perform uh, law enforcement officer duties. And we'll talk about 
fitness for duty a little bit and mental health as we as we go along. But that part of the statute's um, uh, very, very important. Of course, there's a minimum age. You have to be 21 years old. Uh, you must be of good moral character, although I can't find anybody uh, that can give a great definition of what good moral character is. It's something we always uh, seek to try to define. And then lastly, uh, they must have no disqualifying criminal history. So those are the minimum uh, qualifications. But uh, when an officer uh, becomes certified, uh, they're, um, uh, what they need to do to stay certified, um, there, there are still actions there. And what they have to do is uh, they must, um, of course, maintain employment as a law enforcement officer. Should somebody get uh, fired from their job, um, they would not um, have that employment, so they couldn't be an officer at that time. Um, they must maintain 40 hours of annual in-service training, which I'm pretty proud of because there's only a couple of other states that mandate that many hours of training. And um, so we, we mandate the most training of, of any of the uh, of states. Uh, they have to annually complete satisfactory and uh, in a satisfactory manner an, an annual firearms qualification. They must annually uh, attend training on bias-based policing and um, there, there may be other uh, uh, certifications or qualifications that individual, individual agencies uh, command of them, uh, but that is what uh, the state asks for. Grounds for certification um, actions uh, also are met under 745616. And we've, we've talked a little bit about, this is probably a good time to um, uh, remind our listeners, we've talked about our website. Uh, that is kscpost.org, if you'd want to look at that. And also to, to anybody uh, in the room, should you have a question, just please um, interrupt us. It, it'll be no interruption. I usually find my own rabbit trails to go down, so you will not <laughs> throw us off at all. Uh, but 7456.16, if they fail to meet the minimum requirements, uh, that could be grounds for actions from our commission, S such as they do not um, get their 40 hours of annual in-service training done uh, for the training year. Um, we can hold them accountable that way. If they submit false or misleading documents or fail to obtain certification under the KLETA uh, Training Act, uh, we can take action. If they provide false information or fail to cooperate with my agency, um, we can take action. Uh, our agency, we talked about a commission standpoint, but um, maybe uh, a, an internal working standpoint. Uh, we have three investigators uh, that work with the post and work with uh, uh, Ms. Meyer and in investigating those allegations. And so if they, uh, and we can compel them to come in and meet with our investigators, and if they refuse to do so, just failing to do that is something that is actionable uh, by our, our agency. Um, we talked about training. Uh, if they engage in any felony or misdemeanor domestic violence, uh, uh, act again it's important to say act not just uh, conviction uh, when our investigators are assigned a case they look into the conduct not whether a court or a jury has found them innocent or, or guilty um, that really um, doesn't matter in uh, in the direction that our investigators uh, go and we also have 58 misdemeanors that the post can take action on and um, I'm not sure exactly how many misdemeanors there are but that is most of them <laughs> that is uh, most of them there. Um, any uh, use of racial or bias-based policing is something we also investigate and can take action on. And finally, any unpro unprofessional conduct. We've identified 14 different behaviors that, uh, that the post can take certification action on. Behaviors such as uh, use of excessive force or um, uh, performing their duties under the influence um, perhaps those could be crimes, uh, depending on the, the, the circumstances, but they are conduct that we can also um, look into and investigate. And those types of certification actions that we can take, um, 
we can revoke someone's certification, which means they can't be an officer in Kansas. Um, we can suspend their certification, which would typically require some action on their part to get the suspension lifted. Sometimes that might just be for a, a period of time, so it might be a suspension for one year. Um, but typically we're using that in the mental health context. So if someone's found not fit for duty, um, then their, life, their certification will be suspended. And then we set forth the conditions, which would include obviously being found fit for duty by a, a qualified clinician in the future in order to get that lifted. And that has happened in, in some circumstances. We can also reprimand, which is sort of a, um, you know, don't do that again, uh, admonishment. We typically use those in um, instances where someone doesn't get their training hours in a timely fashion that year. Um, but we have suspended and revoked officers who had a history of doing that. And we, we can also condition, which would mean you would put some sort of requirement on the certification you must engage in xyz behavior um, we haven't done that to my knowledge and we've also not censured and then the final thing is we can deny a certification so if someone applies to be a law enforcement officer and we have uh, reason to believe that's not appropriate for any of those grounds we can take the certification action on we can also deny someone um, i kind of wanted to just give you um, an example of the differences where we take action and, and kind of what we take action on. So the example that I would use here is if you have, um, let's say you have an officer, maybe it's a sergeant or a supervising officer, and they engage in an extramarital affair with a subordinate employee. So if you kind of look at broader ethical scope, well, it's probably not good to, to cheat on your spouse. I think ethics conversation, you could probably most people would agree on that. Um, performance issues as far that that's whether or not the agency will take action that's going to depend agency by agency every agency has their own policies and so in this example it's possible that they're probably not going to take action on the on the actual conduct they might i've seen a couple agencies do it um, more likely though you would see a policy that says you can't have a, a relationship with a, a an officer that you're supervising or an employee that you're supervising. So that would be grounds that a lot of agencies would step in and take some sort of corrective action, whether they do you know, some sort of suspension or up to termination. And I think you're going to get a, a presentation on that. You're specific to PICA policies uh, momentarily. And then we at this point would not take action because that doesn't fall under the conduct that's specified in the Training Act. You might be thinking, well, isn't adultery a misdemeanor? It is, but it's actually not one I've seen prosecuted in my time as an attorney, and it's not one of the 58 that's specified. So that's an example of one of the few misdemeanors that's not included. Um, so at, at that point, if we got that fact scenario, we wouldn't take action. The person would get fired. Um, you know, there's a question as to, to the ethical concerns there, but we wouldn't take action. However, we get this fact pattern quite a bit where the, you know, the affair is reported to the agency, the agency brings the person in for um, an interview and they lie. That's when it falls under our auspices. That's where we have the authority to take action if they, uh, an officer is dishonest in an official communication. So that would include that internal investigation. And, and if you get online and look at our actions, you'll see that Unfortunately, that's kind of a common um, way that we do take action is that dishonesty. Um, this is an overview of our process. And so the way that, our, that we work and handle cases is we get the information uh, or the allegation of misconduct in some form. Typically, it comes from that status change, which is that document that the agency has to send us when an officer um, separates. But we can also open an investigation from a citizen complaint, and we have that complaint form on our website. Um, we are seeing a lot more of other agencies are you know, observing some behavior and reporting that to us, or um, the arrests, we typically pick those up off, out of the newspaper. So um, we take whatever document or, or allegation and look at it in the, in the lens of, if everything here is true, does it constitute a violation of the Training Act? If it doesn't, that case is closed and, and we don't open an investigation. If it does, um, and again, we have a really broad lens that we look at that, we just assume that it's true, um, then we, if it could be a violation, then we go ahead and open a case on that, and that's thoroughly investigated. That typically means we'll, at a minimum, we start with getting records from the agency um, or any supporting documentation, but then our investigators are um, 
they're certified law enforcement officers, and so they're going to do some of their own um, interviews and you know, fact gathering themselves. Once they have sufficiently done that process and, and I work with them through that, then we set it for um, a presentation to three of our commissioners, which is the Commission Investigative Committee. And that currently consists of two sheriffs and one chief. Um, and those are elected or appointed by the commission as a whole. Um, so then those three members um, will hear the cases and they'll, they'll just decide, are we going to take action? If so, what is it? Most of the actions are revocations. Um, or are we going to close this with no further action? And like any you know, criminal, any, any sort of step in the justice process, they have some discretion there. They, they may make a determination, well, there was a minor violation, but we don't feel it's appropriate to take certification action. So just like if you have a line officer on the street that can kind of decide, I'm going to give this person a warning or I'm going to you know, give them a citation, um, and a prosecutor has the authority to make some plea deals, the, our commissioners have a little bit of that, that authority as well. And so that's why it's important that they're the decision makers on that. It's not anything that we do in-house. We give that to our commissioners to make those decisions. If they decide they want to take a certification action, we prepare what's called a summary order. And this is all governed by CAPA, which is the Kansas Administrative Procedure Act. And that's what governs your licensing actions for the you know the 26 boards your doctors attorneys um hairdressers real estate realtors um we we all have those same rules about what's an open record what's an open hearing um basically our our procedure for hearings and so once that order is issued the officer has an opportunity to ask for a hearing if they don't do anything then it there's a waiting period of about 18 days and it becomes final but if they ask for a hearing then they get a hearing before three other of our commissioners and by kappa they can't have had any knowledge or um, know any of the facts before they have that at hearing so that's the due process that's allowed to the officer um, and then that here at that hearing panel um, it's a full hearing it's open to the public um, and it's an open record and currently our hearing members are um, they're advised by an assistant attorney general that comes to give them legal advice and writes the order and the current members on that panel are uh, the director of the kbi the superintendent of the highway patrol and then the chief of hayes and so they make a decision and if they decide to take action um, again, there's a, a waiting period before that comes final, and the officer can again take an appeal to district court under the Kansas Judicial uh, Review Act if they disagree with that finding. Um, also, the hearing panel could decide that the action is not appropriate and, and close it out and essentially um, kind of overrules that decision made by the investigative committee. And if, in that case, the case would be closed and there's no action from the officer. That's generally an overview of... Um, what those oh man if i could interrupt you for a minute yeah. i would uh, also add that the the hearings are open record as as miss meyer said and we post those audio recordings on public square so it's another way that we seek to become transparent in in our investigations and actions go ahead thanks um so as far as <laughs> earlier we talked about you know it's kind of important to know what we're doing in kansas if you're kind of making if you're the stakeholders and making some decisions there and again kind of wanted to illustrate when we talk about apples and oranges um, there are states that obviously we have the authority to, to decertify an officer there's some states that don't and the federal government you know your all of your federal law enforcement officers they don't have the authority to um, take certification away. There's, it, it's down to three states that don't have that authority, but you can see it's just recently and within the context of these um, national discussions that are happening that Massachusetts and California just very recently um, adopted legislation to be able to do that. We've, we've been able to do that for quite some time. Uh, we've already talked about the extensive grounds for certification. Many states are like what we were prior to 2012, where they can only take action on felonies um, or convictions. And so, again, we can we can take action on quite a few different grounds. And then, again, we have that wandering officer provision, and that's kind of the, the buzzwords that you hear in the media. And we require the agency to tell us when the officer leaves, but also why. So, again, we have some other states that are like what we used to be where they might have to report when an officer leaves but they don't give the circumstances um, we also um, our certifications actions aren't aren't tied to employment there are some states where um, 
they can only take action if the officer is fired or if the agency makes a recommendation that action be taken. But we can take action if, if we have grounds to believe that a, a person who's currently an officer um, engaged in a violation of the Training Act, we can take action whether they're you know, working as a law enforcement right, officer right now or not. Um, and then finally, we participate in the National Decertification Index, or the NDI. And so that's a nationwide program that um, states can voluntarily um, report their actions to. Um, the problem is, again, it's voluntary, so not all states do it. Um, and then the other problem is, like we see above, not all states can take decertification action. So um, it's not an ideal system, but um, it is something that we participate in. And any agency has the ability to get access to that NDI so they can be running those names you know, prior to hiring. When someone is hired, we, we run them through there too. But there's, there's ways for, for that to be covered both, on both sides. So we have some uh, quantitative data to, to share with you. Uh, first of all, uh, Kansas has just over 8,300 active law enforcement officers uh, that um, are certified. I'm trying to get the technology to work. <laughs> oh, not working for you? Yeah, go ahead and advance. I might. Thank I'm you. Sorry about that. No, you're fine. Uh, so we have uh, approximately uh, ju or just over 8,300 uh, certified law enforcement officers. Between 2012 and 2020, uh, Kansas took 371 certification actions. Now, if we put that in perspective, uh, Minnesota, uh, just a little further north, has uh, a number, a couple thousand more officers than we have. They have approximately, or just under 11,000. They took 33 certifications during that same time period that Kansas took 371. Now, uh, I've, I've been around long enough that uh, we know we can always use statistics to paint our own picture, right? Uh, some folks would look at that and say, well, Kansas must hire a lot of bad cops because they're always getting fired and getting their, their license revoked. And uh, it's until you uh, know the internal workings at the post that you realize Kansas's ability to, um, to um, take action is much broader than the state of Minnesota's. So um, we take action where other states cannot. And that's why our number there is, is high. Um, and, and that's really, it's a point of pride for us. You know, we, we do a pretty good job of policing our own. Uh, again, uh, PA, uh, uh, Pennsylvania has over 27,000 active law enforcement officers between 2014 and 2018. Again, a much smaller window. When we took 307 certification actions, they took 35. No two posts are the same. Um, uh, even uh, our surrounding neighboring states, Missouri, Oklahoma, uh, Nebraska, and Colorado, are, operate much differently than, than what uh, the Kansas Post is operates. Uh, transparency, we've already kind of used this uh, buzzword, but um, it is more than a buzzword. It's something that we strive for at all times. If you go to our website, you'll see that all our certification actions are, are published there. They're published by the officer's name, and then they're also, you can query by the, by the date. So we lump them together by year. And uh, when, you, when you hover over and click on that officer's name, uh, you can uh, not only see what action was taken, but you can also read through the court or through the orders themselves with only a little bit of information sometimes redacted, and that is uh, only redacted because of privacy uh, concerns. Um, all their certification actions, again, are available there. Hearings are open to the public. Um, and we post that on, on Public Square for those to listen to. Uh, certification orders are now posted on our, our, on our website, uh, so you can look at those. And also the integrity bulletin that we publish uh, twice a year and send that out to all police chiefs, sheriffs, and uh, members of the media. Uh, we, in the past, we've sent it to legislators. Um, that is open for anybody to read right off of our uh, website. Uh, now, I, I always say that it would be my strong preference to nev never have to take any certification action on any police officer. And that means they're doing the right thing. There's not a reason to take any certification action, right? However, uh, we also acknowledge we live in a broken world. A uh, world where people make their make decisions, and sometimes those decisions are bad decisions. So my next best thing is to say, when people make those, when bad actors make those bad decisions, we hold them accountable through their certification. 
Uh, looking forward. So uh, I think I'm really excited. Again, I've just been with the Post a couple of months now, but I'm excited on where we're going. I'm excited uh, for Kansas law enforcement. Um, a lot of folks have, have, have turned to me after finding out uh, what I do now and said, oh my goodness, why? Why now? There's such a focus on that. And, and my retort to them is exactly that's where we need leaders to lead. Right. This is a very um, we may look back and, and realize just how influential this time period is in a in a good way. And that's my hope. Um, we are working on adapting, uh, adopting new uh, Kansas administrative regulations. I just realized I set the clicker down. There we go. Uh, we are working on legislation to make a mandatory records check with our uh, with our uh, agency. That is that is a free service. It won't cost your police department any more. Most, I wouldn't say most. I, I can't give you a good data on it, but a lot of police departments already do that. But what we're looking at is making that mandatory for all police departments to do that during their hiring process. Um, we're also working on facilitating law enforcement agencies in the hiring process of non-certified applicants, really kind of putting our ear out to the police chiefs, to the sheriffs, and uh, also to some other groups. They would like a way to know that if Officer A is in their hiring pool and going through their their process, where has Officer A also uh, applied? Because that other agency may have done a background check that caught something that maybe their agency hasn't seen yet. So we're looking on, uh, uh, we're looking at a way to be, again, kind of be that pointer system to say, hey, city of Topeka, um, this person also applied in Kansas City, Kansas. We don't know why they didn't make it through the process. Maybe, maybe they just weren't the best candidate. Or maybe Kansas City, Kansas found something, something in the background that disqualified them as an applicant. So then Topeka now knows to get with that other agency and find out what that is. And our laws, again, uh, I forget what year it was, but we had the, the, the laws uh, specifically changed so that that other agency can share that data, that, those personnel records uh, with, with you. Um, and finally, uh, we're just we're we're interested in doing outreach. We're inter interested in doing um, things like this for our police chiefs, our sheriffs, and uh, any any community that calls us. And then we just wanted to. We know that representation matters, and so we want to know what. What does that look like for our law enforcement officers? The interesting thing is, like Director Schrader mentioned, I mean, when we have more um, scrutiny on agencies, that naturally trickles down to C-Post as well. We really hadn't pulled this numbers, these numbers in any comprehensive way prior to 2020 when the governor committed, uh, created the Commission on Racial Equity and Justice. Just nobody asked for these before. Nobody was really looking at it. They may have gone to individual agencies to get it, but we, we kind of had to figure out how to pull the numbers first. But once, oops, once we, um, thanks, once we got that, that done, we um, have that up there for you so, so you can take a look. There's a couple of these that need explanation. The first thing I'll tell you is we are currently in the process of updating our central registry. Some of the terms we have on our demographic form aren't quite right. So we are separating ethnicity out. Um, so we just don't have that done quite yet, but we're working on that. And we're also going to add um, Native, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander. And then I think it's important, um, we've got the other category up there, but we also need to add more than one race. So um, obviously there's a number of people that are checking that. And then the past, um, that was reported as um, not race recorded. So if you look up on this slide and it mm. says not reported, which is a kind of a 25 percent, that may have been that they didn't check a box or it may have been that they checked more than one <coughs> box. And in the past, those that wasn't a mandatory field. They they didn't we didn't send that form back if somebody didn't check it. Well, we need to do that. So we started in 2020. We started sending the form back to me if the box wasn't checked. But we unfortunately don't have a way of knowing the not reported. Is it because they checked more than one box or is it because they just didn't report it? So that's a, a little hard to capture. But what I can tell you is the dating mo the data moving forward is only going to get better. Um, we, we don't love that we kind of have that large unknown quantity, but it will get better um, moving forward. Um, we also Let's see, we, um, 
the older records also, we didn't always ask for it. So again, all of that's just going to get better. Um, in as far as the gender goes, um, you can see that there's five up there that says null data. And that just means the old forms and it didn't even have that as an option in the past. Um, if, if you look at those five that we have, they're probably males, but you know, we don't know that for sure. So um, that's it's a small amount that's not reported there. So it's less concerning than the, the not reported on the on the race demographics. And then finally, education. Um, this is also a little needs kind of an asterisk next to it because probably about five to 10% of the forms we get where an officer reports something higher than a high school degree. We, we aren't sure that it meets our minimum, the way that our high school equivalency is defined. So we have to send that back and then we only report the high school data that meets that requirement. And so five to 10% of the numbers up there underrepresent the advanced educa education. And we again think this is important data to capture moving forward because there's some um, research out there that suggests that a higher level of education is correlated to lower use of force, excessive use of force incidents. And so um, this is something that I think um, various agencies are going to want to know from us in the future. Um, we also know that um, many officers get their advanced education while they're an officer. And we don't have a, a way to capture that either. So if someone goes to an agency and stays there for 20 years or their whole career, we're never getting a new demographic. So we don't have a way to update that. The other thing is, even if they are moving on and we did get a new demographic in the past, we weren't updating that in our system. So that's a change we've made internally recently where we'll capture the best information we have. But we know anecdotally that um, so many officers, you know, a lot of times for promotion, it's required to get to have an advanced degree at some agencies. And so we know that this underrepresents, but at least it's um, you know, it's sort of a starting point. And, um, you know, at this point, an individual would have to kind of go to the individual agencies to to have probably the true numbers if they collect those. So that wraps up that part. And I think um, I just want to echo Director Schrader in saying we appreciate the opportunity to be here and I think we'll stand for any questions if you have them. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions? Yes. Councilwoman Healer. <laughs> we can't see sometimes, and so we've learned to kind of holla. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have a, actually a number of them. We've been, as you probably know, deeply immersed in this and meeting as a body for over a year now. And so some of these questions are cumulative, but um, it, it's great to have you here. It, it sounds like you're keeping great records and also more transparent records than anybody else's at this point. And that does seem to be making somewhat of a difference here, here in the community. Um, so some of my questions have to do then with, with this sort of cumulative, some of the things we've talked about that we could do perhaps a little more here as well. Um, one of the issues we've talked about is training versus performance and that you can count how much training somebody went to, but is that really the right way to measure whether they are exhibiting those best practices on the street? Have you all um, looked at ways to measure um, some of those key performances? And obviously ones we've been talking about have to do with um, bias, exhibiting bias in any way. So, you know, to just go to anti-bias training once a year doesn't mean that you're not exhibiting bias on the street. And so um, are there ways that you are, have already arrived at or are looking at to measure whether someone is actually exhibiting bias? Is that one of those behaviors, the unprofessional behaviors? I don't know what your list is of unprofessional behaviors. Yes. Just as an example. Yes, it is. Um, uh, so specific to that, we... Um, we do not uh, evaluate training. Um, it doesn't fall within our th authority. So I, I can tell you that we haven't looked into that specifically. Is there anything to, to add to 
Yeah, I, I have a couple extra, a couple points to add. Uh, as far as the competency-based, um, the law enforcement training center it has just recently changed their curriculum um, that they're going to measure competency over like the test taking, and that will also be required by the, the academies as well. Now that's at the basic training level. It's not really responsive to your question of ongoing in the career, but there are some ways to measure that. Um, we don't, and there's also been discussion of what you're referring to as far as the bias and, and the uh, Governor's Commission on Racial Equity suggested that perhaps we adopt some sort of certification process that would look at bias. The issue with that is, you know, with over 400 agencies throughout the state, really that probably needs to come with, from within the agency. So it needs to be your supervisors, your field training officers that are observing it. I feel like if we were to come in and do some sort of audit, it's kind of going to be a check the box, just like what you said the training can sometimes be considered. And so that that's not something that we have. We certainly don't have the staffing or um, ability to do that right now. Um, it may be a, a good question for the academy to kind of figure out. Um, they may have some resources as far as um, measuring competencies because they're doing that. They're, they're going to start doing it at basic already. Um, and I think that's kind of all I have. So basically, I, I guess I would think that no. if if, for instance, they'd had write ups coaching about that and then the issues had continued, that there would be documentation. Not, not just anecdotal or not something where you can sit down once a year and fill out a form. I mean, I, you could self-report, of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, the issues of, and, and I think those are the issues we've been dealing with from the community, especially in the last year, the issues of profiling, um, treating, treating people differently, um, not being able to either start an engagement in a respectful and de-escalated way or get it there as soon as possible, you know, to demonstrate that performance. And often, I, I think it's a standard practice that supervising officers, if there's a bad situation going on, get called in. So they do observe, if not the beginning of that interaction, they're there before it's over and can pretty well assess the situation. And part of what one of the reasons we're here a key reason we're here is are there ways we can make sure that not only that the training is occurring, but that the behavior subsequently does not happen, that we're at the best that we can be. So I just wondered if, if um, again, we're, departments, including ours, have been adding some training, some performance standards that they didn't have before, as well as different kinds of training. Um, but to me, for instance, those things that we've just talked about are more important as to whether than you've whether you've had an extramarital affair, mm -hmm. you know. So to fire somebody for that, but have them on the street mm -hmm. <laughs> be, when they're not handling the public in the best possible way, yeah, is and I so it was not intended to be too narrow a question, but whether you're looking at ways to measure the to use the performance, yeah. I, 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 again, there's a lot of, um, and I think you're ahead of the curve on on, a, on that. So kudos for that. But um, there's there's a lot of uh, local control and accountability that I think needs to take place. Of course. And um, for us to put into some sort of general blanket um, type of policy, it may not be best for all the communities involved. And so um, you you know we're kind of. Uh, I think we're borderline talking internal affairs investigations, those sorts of things, to which we don't we don't get involved in those. We do at at the request of an agency, not in the in that investigation per se, but if that if they were investigating an officer for a reason uh, of a training act violation, um, then then we would look into it. And a lot of most of or, or much of what you've. Re re referenced is also you've called it performance issues and we don't have authority, we don't have statutory authority to take action on that. Um, and I'm not sure if you would want the state regulatory agency to take action. You probably want some leeway to, to make some internal corrections and, um, and again, I think you're going to have a presentation on what all you have available to you. As far as the bias um, goes, the, the action that we can take 
the, the conduct we can take action on is very specific and it's set out in statute and it basically has to be an officer that takes action or fails to take action based on one of those protected classes. Now you might see officers that are exhibiting bias in other ways. I've had a number of, of the forms come through that an officer was fired for um, inappropriate racist language on their Facebook page. Well, I probably can't directly correlate that to a specific stop. Um, maybe we can pull some num num data from their stops if the agency collects that, but that would be something that is totally appropriate for the agency to take action. We don't have statutory authority to now. And I mean, certainly there, there could be a conversation about, you know, if that needed to be broadened or not, but w right now we can only operate under that statute. So, you're, you were talking about KSA 22-4609, which must define racial or bias-based policing in some way. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, Chief Wheelis is just popping over here, so maybe <laughs> let him enter the conversation. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, would you mind if I jumped in here for a second? <clears throat> okay. I, I think I think what what both Michelle and Doug said. I can add a little light to from the local perspective. They're exactly right. They're the state regulatory agency for accreditation. So the specific acts that you're talking about, the complaint process, which we've, we've gone through before and, and mm -hmm. we'll go through again, is kind of the initiating action for some of these things or the internal observations from their peer groups that are reported up the chain. But those professional standard unit investigations that we've talked about, specific to these, I mean, our policies, both the department and the city's personnel manual cover up to and including termination of employment for the kind of racial bias acts, actions and verbiage and incidents that you're talking about. Where Kansas Sea Post comes involved in that is after the individual, and they're, they're dependent to some degree on the individual agencies to do these initial stages of the investigation. So we would complete, in a normal generic sense, we would complete our professional standards investigation and when we made a change of status form, such as separation of employment, et cetera, those notifications then go to CPOST. In that notification thing, they would see that, and it, could also, it also covers, and this is one of the big things we've talked about, resignations while under investigation. Mm -hmm. The Topeka Police Department completes our PSU file, whether they're our employee or whether they resign before the investigation is completed. We still complete our entire investigation to the best of our abilities. We still make the notifications to Kansas Sea Post in regards to the circumstances. They then, in turn, in general terms, request our PSU file, the investigative reports, the evidence. That's when the certification piece comes into play. So those are all layers, um, and they obviously do their own pieces of investigation specific to the certification from those, but the initial pieces would be with the local agencies for these specific acts. And, it, and it's, it's exactly what we've talked about before with the ABLE program and all of those things. How do we prove those things? Well, this is part of that process, uh, but it's heavily reliant upon the local agencies because it's their policies and guidelines that are the basis for the administrative actions, such as termination of employment that then trigger their certifications. That's the only piece I wanted to add, and, and I'm sure the experts can go from there, but there's a certain level, at least from my viewpoint, at the Topeka Police Department, that we take care of the initial steps that you're talking about, prove that people are either complying or not complying with the policies that we have and, and state laws, and then they take the certification uh, examples and investigations from there. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to follow it because I know we've talked about CPOS, right. but and and just think, putting this, so the referrals, any information you get comes from that agency who's simply reporting out to you. So it, that, that's part of the investigative process. Um, most most of our investigations initiate from the uh, form, the status change form that departments will send to us. They have to send that status change form within 30 days mm -hmm. of a status change. So a officer terminating, uh, a terminating an officer or them saying, oh, I'm not going to go through that investigation and they resign. Either way, um, there's just a different checkbox that comes to us uh, in the, on that same form. And, and again, uh, all these forms are on uh, our website. Should anybody want to look at them? It asks for the department to narrate why that is. 
And um, if an officer is terminated, we also think it's important that that officer is allowed due process so that th sure. they can also you know, refute or uh, give us whatever information they want from their perspective. So, I, I'm just sorry, <laughs> whether it's us or any of the other agencies in Kansas, so in a way, it, it, all, it still drills back then to whether that local organization, what, what, how they have set their own standards, and whether they are coaching or disciplining or ultimately either kind of forcing, a, if you will, a, a resignation or a separation for some reason. That has to be happening at the local level for it to even hit your radar. Uh, for the most part, yes. Um, so most of our investigations, as I started to say, and I, I again, rabbit trail, um, <laughs> come from those forms, from those status change forms. However, um, on our website, we have a complaint form. Anybody, any citizen can go on there, fill that out. And we don't have to have it just in writing. We take phone calls at, at the Sea post okay. with verbal reports from citizens uh, quite often. So um, there are many different areas of of input that we can can and do start investigations with. Is that so, yeah. so? If, for instance, you weren't you weren't getting anything coming up the ladder from Topeka, Kansas, correct? But you were steadily getting phone calls from people identifying situations they were aware of. Yes, it would get on your radar. That absolutely, way. and um, it's kind of a double-edged sword. We even accept uh, <laughs> anonymous reports. Mm -hmm. um, our only problem with anonymous reports is. It's hard to it's Can't hard to check into those, yeah. um, but we want to it's allow valuable. that because who knows? Um, just with a, a little bit of anonymous information, we may be able to you know prevent mm -hmm. some bad act. I think it's also important to note that the attorney general's office receives complaints for racial bias and profiling, investigates across the whole state. So you have the and ability, they do investigate, right? And, and they okay. investigate, and and I, I'm sure if it got to a a report back from the attorney general's office that you had an officer problem at this issue at this agency and then that agency ended their employment that would again then trigger Kansas Sea Post on the back end so th there's a number of different agencies that all kind of dovetail back in to your certification which is the big piece of what Kansas Sea Post does and we actually conduct those uh, the attorney general receives those complaints but then they sent they forward them to us for investigation um, and so we definitely get those cases and we're seeing a lot more officers you know if someone is still employed uh, we're seeing more officers make reports to us about other officer conduct and we can open a case you know whether it's a citizen complaint an officer complaint a chief from another city um, those all have the same weight as the form that we get when someone separates we can open a case equally on all of those the only other thing i'll say is there's mandatory reporting when an officer separates the only other place that sort of mandatory reporting is is discussed in the training act is there's a there's a part of unprofessional conduct that says if an officer personally observes conduct that would be a violation of the training act they're required to report that to their agency head now it doesn't then make the agency head report it to us and i think the reason is because you know the commissioners did want to allow for internal pro the internal process of um you know training and 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 some of the other things that you have that you can can employ. So um, I think that might come into discussion in the future with our commissioners, but that's that's the way that it stands right now. And our, our department policy requires that off-duty observation of on-duty conduct, misconduct, the violence policy to us, and, and I'm required as the chief of police to do that. That's what our internal policy requires, both those, that, the, both those facets, from the employee and also from the, the chief of police. And so... So for us to, if something comes up the line, for you all to kind of grab onto it, does it need to be on your list? I mean, do, do we all need to be making sure that your list of 14 is complete these days or, you know, for unprofessional conduct, let's say. Um, I don't know what's on your list of 14, but ABLE is a good example. Obviously, those concepts became had been on some many agencies books probably for a long time that being that if an officer sees somebody else doing something that's not appropriate for a situation instead of looking at rank order or the moment or whatever that they have a responsibility to speak up and that's a big it's big to bring that forward so i don't know if that's on your list 
Go ahead. I, I was just going to say, so we, we do rely and we put value on uh, the fact that our form not only is a, a checkbox like resigned under investigation, but also allows the department to submit a narrative. And we look through that narrative to see if there is a Training Act violation. So does somebody need to know every all 58 misdemeanors? There does not need to be an expert in each okay. department, just as long as they, they put that narrative down. Now, we, we do get forms in that just say policy violation. And we will follow up by calling that agency and say, well, what do you mean? Because some policy violations could be a Training Act violations. Others, such as, you know, the they were tardy three days in a row and you know this just ain't working out with them so they get fired well that's not a training act violation so we do follow up on on that but we rely on those narratives and we are look we have um a number of administrative regulations right now that we are um there's a pretty lengthy process for that and we're working on that we have at least i think we have four that have been approved by the commission and we have another two to three that we want to take to them so we are again we're looking at that list constantly and saying, I mean, basically what happens is we get a couple cases where we say we can't take action on that, but we should. And so we're, we're expanding that list. And um, certainly if an agency feels that there's a deficit in either the statute or the regulation, um, our, our commission meetings are open meeting and the, our commissioners would be happy to hear um, from, you know, from an agency with, with suggestions about statutory changes. Thank you. It, it's a, I appreciate that. I mean, for us working hard at it at the local level to know that you're at least with us or a step ahead of us at the state level because it's clear that your role is really important as kind of a check and balance for us. And so, again, I have one suggestion and then I'll pass the baton here. Mm -hmm. um, when you're working on your demographics, I personally am very involved and invested in the diversity issues. Um, you may want to look at, if you haven't, at very contemporary lists of Gender identification, for instance, male and female is over, uh, for instance. Um, other things that have turned out, you know, CIT certification, I know you're working on that. That could be very good data to have that kind of helps set a bar to statewide as to whether just certain cadres of officers or all officers have mental health training and so on. Um, but even um, religious or non-religious kinds of things, those have made a difference in people's trust and relationships here, certainly, but, but everywhere. Uh, Muslim, for instance, or um, different, I don't know, you can end up with a pretty darn long list if you're going to be real specific, <laughs> yeah. but it, it has made a difference in relationships. So, And the, the gender issue has been pointed out to us when we have discussed that internally. The reason it's like it is right now is because the academy um, assigns rooms based on gender. I mean, they double bunk. And so um, we have, yeah, we have a dis <laughs> that discussion comes up and uh, we are part of a national organization, IADLIS, that's the other posts and training academies. And so there are some states where, um, you know, non-binary individuals have gone through the academy and it, it's not an issue. It's, we have the capability to, to update that form uh, as necessary. Um, and it's probably something that we'll talk about a little bit. Some people More. don't want it broadcast either, so there's a, there's back and right. forth. But it, I just wanted to mention it because it's important we, to it a is lot important. of people. Yeah, we appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, um, <clears throat> Deputy Mayor. Do you have any questions, comments, concerns? A couple of things. Just one, following up on what Councilwoman Hiller was talking about, was regarding to self-identifying uh, gender. Or religion, I served on the Governor's Commission on Racial Profiling, and that was a sticking point that really we struggled with because oftentimes people get very offended when you even ask those things on the street, and it made it very complicated to try and craft any kind of reporting system to get that information to come in because people could be in a real good mood and then all of a sudden you start to ask that and the next thing you know is why do you need to know that? And, and so it made it difficult for the officers on the street. Uh, it wasn't that they were trying to be prying, but it was a suggestion that, they, uh, that was made to use that on the forum and the arguments there were how does that relate to whether or not 
there was that was part of the criminal act that they've been stopped for or the investigation how would that play into that that might then be used later on as a way to say well that's the only reason i got stopped that's the only reason uh, the incident was pursued so there is some there are some issues with there asking really everything you know mm -hmm. what color socks you got on anything mm -hmm. you start to get so far down the road that you i think in my opinion start to lose focus of what you, the interaction is between law enforcement and the citizen. The one question I might want to, uh, would like to ask too is I'm familiar with the notification. I understand that uh, that status change. Uh, uh, is that information uh, shared with uh, other states? Let's say uh, an officer who was in Kansas decides to go, wants to go to Colorado, Nebraska, anywhere. Yeah, so by statute, that central registry data, it's very specific as to what data can be shared with whom, what's available under open records and what not, what's not. And the status change form is available both to law enforcement agencies in Kansas, but also agencies outside of Kansas and licensing the, the posts of the other states. Okay. Being available is good. How many do you think ask? We Just, we get a lot through the okay. posts, um, but particularly, I mean, we, we get a lot from Missouri. We get a lot from uh, Colorado. They have just a form they send us, and it's just kind of a matter of course. Um, I don't have numbers on that, but that's something that we could look internally to, to maybe see if we can drill in on that. I, I think it's good that it's available and it should be shared because that takes the wandering officer beyond the, the state boundaries. Uh, because we want to be able to protect citizens across the country. And if we do our due diligence here in Kansas and make that information available, I think we're being proactive and, and helping others. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask about, and I think uh, um, I, that might be going down a rabbit hole, is the um, racial profiling training that's mandatory. Mm -hmm. uh, in the past, and Chief, maybe you can update me or you you can, is that the, the training hours are mandatory, but we had some struggle at one time trying to uh, find some consistency in that training or that, you know, individual agencies might have better resources, like maybe they had a large university at their city so they could pull those resources in. And smaller communities, too, uh, had a little more difficulty in varying that training that, that, so it wouldn't be the same video that you saw last year. Mm -hmm. you, you didn't want to get into that rut. So you wanted to make it uh, relevant to what the times were. And so is there something that, Chief, you can update me on? And I know that might fall outside of your purview, but I know that it's required mm -hmm. to maintain their certification. I think I think that some of the, uh, and, and I you know, certainly wouldn't want to speak for, for smaller agencies that, I, that I've never worked at or for, but um, I think that some of those struggles still exist with the standardization would be my answer for you. I know the Topeka Police Department in the last close to 30 years that, that I've been here, um, and I know it is new training, new, it's not the same video, new new training, and, it, and it's live training, and, and so it has morphed in with our entire culture of our training where it's a lot more scenario-based now, it's interactive. Um, it, it has come along the same lines as all of our 40-hour plus uh, in-service training that we do here at the police department. I certainly can't speak to across the state, yeah. um, and I think it's, there would probably be some struggles at smaller agencies with, with less resources, uh, but that would just be a generalization. But for us, it, it has morphed every year. While some of the content and the philosophies are the same, it's, it's not the same because a lot of times it's different instructors. And we've, we've brought in outside instructors. We've brought in legal. And, and we kind of have some of those advantages in our community with Washburn and, and some of those things. So I can tell you only from our experience, it has been refreshed as part of all of our training program is and is a lot more um, indicative of just like what we've been talking about with ABLE and those kind of scenario-based interactive. This is the idea. This is the scenario is to prove it, not just talk about it. And that's why I asked the question is because certainly across the state, it's hope that everyone will be able to have that kind of flexibility and growth in that area. But specifically for Topeka, because that's why we're here today, is to look at Topeka and how it has adjusted, uh, stayed relevant to the times and updated all the things that we're very concerned about 
in this ov overview of, of uh, police training, accountability, transparency, and all those things. So it's good to hear that it has changed over time because yeah. I think that's extremely important that it has to be, I keep overusing this word, but it has to be relevant to the days and times. It can't be, because I know how it has been sometimes, yeah. especially when it first started. Uh, there was a, uh, a package of information that went out and everybody used it. Uh, but you need to break away from that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I think it's it, having the diversity of instructors who yeah. present it makes, makes a great deal. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, whether it's age, younger, and, 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 or whether it's just diversity in regards to their ethnicity. But those things all bring perspective. The life experiences they have are different, too. So I think that's the same. Now, I will tell you, tell you this. With KLETC kind of going to a standard education program across the state for the academies, I think the long-term vision for law enforcement in the state of Kansas is, is to do some standardization of all these trainings. But I think it's very important, and I think we kind of miss it sometimes. Just because it's a check-the-box, it's a mandatory training, doesn't mean it's a check-the-box as to how you provide that training and how you package that training and how you present that training. And I, I kind of have a tendency to echo Doug's sentiments. I mean, why would you be in a leadership role in law enforcement right now? Because this is the place to be. The, the challenge is here, but the opportunity is here too. And, and I think that I, I'm glad you asked that question about our training because I, if you went through the, the uh, bias-based police and training now, it, it wouldn't resemble anything like the training that you went through all the years. There's not a packet in the video, I can assure you. Well, uh, Councilwoman Hiller and I kind of sat in. Did was you? it last year? Yeah, we did. We last sat summer. Uh, uh, um, I should, I should have known. Yeah, <laughs> just, just to see, you know, uh, because I think it's extremely important. I think the, the, the uh, inclusion of, what, as you listed, the participants of, of uh, not just a diverse group, but a, a group that represents this community and that, uh, that they're involved in that adaptation of what we present to the officers. And the other thing I think some people have a misunderstanding of is that because there's 40 hours required, that's not the, to limit you. If right. you want to give more than 40 hours, I've seen some comments where people said, 40 hours, gosh, what can you learn in that? Well, that's an ongoing thing in addition to everything else is, that's going on because there, I know, uh, officers who take their own initiative and go outside of that 40 hours to seek uh, more in-depth training. And I've seen that while I was there, and that's been a while ago. So I don't really imagine that that's increased in effort. And I would encourage the agency to... Um, whenever possible, make those training opportunities available to the, not just uh, command staff, but the, the line officers so that they can continue to increase and see uh, how that changes, because I think that will only service um, better as a community. So I, I appreciate the update because that's always something that uh, I'm concerned about is, are we continuing to be up with the times? I, I don't think we can ever talk about police training enough. I don't think we can ever in incorporate new, inventive, innovative ideas. Um, I think what Doug talked about a lot, this, the state of Kansas, maybe nationally doesn't understand, but the state of Kansas is in good shape. I mean, just being, we talked a lot about these wandering officers, just being part of the NDI. Mm -hmm. it, it would be hard for us to put quantitative numbers, but bad actors, I think is what he said, are aware as they travel from state to state, which states report mm -hmm. and, and check and which page states pull the most certifications. So we may not be able to put a number to it, but there are people that choose not to come who are wandering officers to the state of Kansas because of what CPOST does and the advancements that we continue to do. So the, the state of Kansas is, is, is right up there where it needs to be, and, and that doesn't mean we're done, but we're, we certainly have a lot of positives, and I think that's the great piece of, of Doug and, and Michelle coming out to the various communities to, to give them the information about really the good shape that we're in and the advancements that they made over the last few years, and we're going to keep going that direction because nobody, you've heard me say this many times, nobody dislikes bad cops more than good cops. No, and that's, that's, that's why we, we work at what we do. Uh, training's a great piece of it. Yeah, well, I appreciate that, Chief. Thank you very much.
Now, if I could just add the Law Enforcement Training Center, they uh, recognized your comments as well. And so I think they just recently revamped their online training because some agencies don't have the resources. Yeah. And they also are bring the name escapes me, unfortunately, but there's a nationally recognized like biospace starting kind of like ABLE, but it's for biospace policing. They had that before. It was really expensive and they're bringing it back. The director just recently told me so it's recognized as cutting edge in that area so th there will be those opportunities moving forward mm, thank you michelle I, and I, I like the fact that she dropped in that they are starting to see an increase yeah. from law enforcement officers reporting misconduct of other law enforcement yeah. officers at their agencies and at other agencies too and, and, and i think that's a, a big piece that reinforces the proof or that this is what we say this right. is what we do yeah he knows i'm, I'm interested in that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you madam chair Thank you. Um, let's see, you kind of took my question there, Deputy Mayor. Oops. So how do we react to um, officers that are coming to Kansas? Does C-Post go back and, and try to get information on them? If they're, how does that happen when, when they come to Kansas to apply for a license? Yeah, I'll briefly and then maybe turn it over to Chief. Uh, every department does their background checks um, a little bit differently, but it would start with the departments doing their background checks. Uh, we are um, at the post, we're kind of the gatekeeper to Kansas agencies having access to the National Decertification Index. And so I'm, I'm sure I didn't look it up, but I'm sure uh, Topeka has requested that and they have, have that authority. Um, but other, any other law enforcement agency can request that of us and we can give access to that. But is there more on the background piece that uh, perhaps uh, Chief could better answer? Yeah, and, and I think that's right. Just to cover those two points, yes, yes, we are on the, the NDI. We make requests quite a bit. Uh, Michelle and I were talking before we actually came on the air, and uh, I think she would tell you, too, that the professional standards unit here at the Topeka Police Department has a great deal of conversation back and forth and works very well um, with Kansas Sea Post. We're, we're a very big believer in it. So whenever they have whatever access they have to for the backgrounds we're interested in, um, I, I like the piece that Doug was talking about, about the advancements of even if an uh, applicant that you're looking at has not gotten through a process at another agency that that's a notification that we can get and then we can reach out on our own and to that agency and say hey what, what can you get tell us about this that just gives us another piece of the puzzle but um, every piece of information and access that we can get through the background check process on our applicants is, is what we're interested in involved in right now and we're, we're actively involved with the Kansas Sea Post on the front end of the hiring vetting process all the way to the end of employment uh, termination processes when we get to those those uh, sad state of affairs. Thank you. And the reason I asked is, you know, a lot of our constituents have asked that same question. You know, um, you know, they're concerned about the what did you call it? The wondering the wondering officer, you know, if, he, if he's doing bad here, how do we know he's not going to take it somewhere else? Or how do we know that if he's doing bad somewhere else, how is he going to bring it here? So that's that's a good good to know that. Um, also, how often does the um, C post board or commission change? Yeah, so we do change from time to time uh, with retirements and um, various various duties. Um, so this last, I would say, year we've had two changes within the last year. Um, I would have to refer to uh, Michelle to give you a, an annual ballpark though. I'm not sure if that's a lot or not very many. Yeah, it, and it kind of just goes in cycles because um, Director Schrader went through the statutory basis for how those commissioners are appointed. And mm -hmm. so they have to meet that, you know, they're chief of this population or sheriff, et cetera. And then the governor is the one that appoints those um, actual commissioners. By statute, if the commissioner leaves the position that got them the, the appointment as commissioner, that terminates, the, that terminates their role as a commissioner. And then the terms are essentially four years. And so um, those go up to the governor for reappointment. And um, yeah, I don't, I, I think it would be fair to say an average of two a year, but there are some years that there's no changes and there's some years that it, it just recently we had five so it, it's kind of just ebb and flow with the employment cycle 
And I think it's also important to note that uh, the replacement process, uh, what that looks like, uh, let's say if uh, one of the sheriffs um, left, they retired, um, the process would have their association, the KSA, Kansas Sheriff's Association, uh, submit three names to the governor's office and the governor of, the governor's office can select any one of those three names or go outside of those recommendations. So each of our commissioners are appointed by the governor. And that's that's good to know. It looks like a very diverse group there. Um, let me see. I thought I had one more question. I guess not. I think Mike took my question there. Okay. Well, um, do you guys have anything in closing to add that you would like to add? I, I think this is very, very good um, information to have. Um, and it's very good to share with our constituents. So if they want to report something or um, um, so they will know if they want to get on your website, I'm going to go on your website. And, and, and just to check check it out. Excellent, I would encourage you to, and, and I would encourage all of your listeners to do so as well. Um, I think you'll find that our office is very reactive. And so um, we will address any concerns that come to us. And I just wanna close with um, my appreciation again uh, to everybody here uh, with the city of Topeka in, in hosting us today. It's, it's been an honor, it's been an honor. And Michelle? Yes. Do you have any any closing remarks? I think the only kind of um, just to circle back on on one point um, is when we had that discussion about um, you know corrective action through the agency that you as an agency feel needs to be addressed at the state level. Um, one of the reasons we don't go delve into performance issues is because someone may not be a good Topeka officer. Um, perhaps because of the pace um, or or some you know some of the requirements, but they may be a, a perfectly well suited officer for a more rural area, and so that 's where some of that performance we take it we take certification action when there 's a clear statutory violation of what 's set out. Uh, as, as misconduct, but there are some officers that we've seen, you know, not do well at one agency, but kind of do well at, at a different agency with, with different pressures. Which is true with any job, sure. really. Yeah. Sometimes sure. it's just not a good fit. Yeah, I but suppose, I, if I also, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. No, go. but I also appreciate you having us up here and the, the dialogue. Well, it's, it's been a pleasure. Uh, council members, do you have anything else? No, thank you. If not, we want to thank you again. Be safe going home. Back to Wichita. I should I shouldn't say home because home is Topeka. But um, going back to Topeka, have a or back to Wichita. Have a safe safe travels. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you again. Do we want to break for a few minutes so they can clear the room? No. No. Okay. I, does the chief have a presentation oh, yeah. to give? They don't want to give the chief a break. They voted no on that one. Chief, I should turn that off. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. We'll go on to number four. <laughs> Progressive correction action. She's going to take, oh, take, take care of it for me. We're always cutting you short anyway. Sorry. Thank, Thank you, Michelle. So yeah. Thank you very much. Chairwoman, I, I am to understand that you want to go ahead and start this, this next section. Is that correct? Yes. I, I don't know how long we'll be, but we're going to get it started. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> but take your time. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, we're, we're going to do a presentation on uh, the TPD progressive uh, and corrective action process. It's going to dovetail in right behind uh, the, the discussion that we just had with Kansas Sea Post because it'll be kind of the Kansas Sea Post will be at the end of the presentation. Are we supposed to have something to follow along with? Uh, Not today. You received it in August. This is this is one we've pushed a couple different. I didn't bring my whole notebook uh, this time. <laughs> I can certainly give you. Here's what we'll do. I'll give you okay. mine. And, uh, I'll no, that's all right. I just I, just I want to make sure. On. If I've got it, I, that's fine. I just need to get out some paper. 
because I can read. You guys know how I, I do these things anyway. I'm only going to use that as kind of a general guideline about what I want to talk about. Um, but what we're going to talk about, and, and I think it's important um, for terminology, uh, progressive corrective action is, is, is essentially the verbiage that we use um, for employee, employee disciplinary actions at the police department. And you'll see as we move through the presentation why I'm spending time um, with defining a little bit of these things. But progressive is defined as proceeding step by step on a designated scale. In this context, uh, the increasing level of the corrective action for repeated infractions of a similar nature, not serious enough to constitute just cause for termination. Now, the language in this section is very specific because that's the legal, legal language in the policy of the department and the personnel manual for the city that defines uh, corrective action from a human resources standpoint and also uh, contract language for the collective bargaining agreements with the union. And that's basically what the next point talks about is it gives management um, guidance. It allows all of this information to be formalized um, and be accessible to employees so that they understand the language and the definitions of that language that's the guidance on these issues, um, which is basically what that just says. So the corrective action philosophies and principles, uh, we have a mandatory acceptance and reporting and investigation. Those are the three very important points of all employee misconduct allegations. And the other part of this is they, there's a requirement that there be finalized and documented disposition of that investigation. So let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, those are important pieces for public trust and for uh, human resource compliance as well, that, that we take every allegation, and that includes, as you heard the CPOS people talking about, anonymous ones of employee misconduct, and we go through the investigative process, which is documented, along with a final disposition of the investigation. And I, I believe that it, that is essential for enhancing and maintaining the level of public trust that we have. Um, it also preserves organizational integrity and makes us to be as an effect, uh, effective a public safety agency as we can. Because I know, as we've talked about many times in this committee, if you have deterioration of the public trust, um, that affects everything that you do from a law enforcement agency standpoint. Then the underlying guidance um, for all philosophies of corrective action for any employee group, and essentially ours as well, is to acknowledge the issue and rectify the future occurrence of unacceptable and prohibited behavior. And for it to be unacceptable and prohibited behavior, they have to know what it is. It has to be an accessible, documented, standardized, formalized piece that they're aware of. And I'll, I always pause long enough and then Gretchen knows to change the slide. There we go. Um, <laughs> consistency and fairness are essential managerial elements in this process. And so I'm going to take just a few more minutes and define some terms for you because this is not something that you see me do a lot of in our presentations, but the language on these specific human resources pieces that go with collective bargaining and personnel matters matter. I guess personnel matters matter. Right. Could have chose a different word there, I guess, mm -hmm. but but they, but they really kind of do um, because everything that you do on these cases, you are building from the small infractions all the way to the end, and you hope that you never get there to the end of termination type employee. But it's all about the consistency, the fairness, the language being the same, and the documentation that goes through as you progress from similar infractions of a similar nature, time and time again. So that's why I think it's important. But consistency, holding everyone similarly accountable for similar unacceptable behavior, and fairness, understanding the circumstances that contributed to the behavior, and applying consequences in a, in a way that reflects this understanding. So you know what the rules are, you broke the rules, and now there are consequences for those rules that are broken. Factors to be considered, and, and this is all right in the policy number that you see at the top there, 3.8. It's called uh, Topeka Police Department Policy 3.8, Performance Management and Grievance Procedures. Um, and it, that's available as well um, publicly posted. But factors to be considered that we look at, everything is a case-by-case -case basis, but you apply the general philosophies of consistency and fairness to all of those. Other things that we look at and are, and are required to um, by city and department policy code is employee experiment experience 
which is time of service, career path, specialized skills and training. And I know we've talked a great deal in a, in a great number of different topics that experience level of the officer or the personnel involved in the incident is, is definitely a factor because we have different standards for levels of experience and knowledge at, of our employees. Why was the employee motivated uh, to commit the policy violation or the infraction? Was it a legitimate police purpose? Was it personal interest? Um, those are things that are important too because they go to intent um, and also can ultimately uh, be a factor in, in overall character and judgment, which we have had many discussions on many different topics about what a uh, important factor those could be in law enforcement. And whether it was intentional or unintentional errors, um, I liked what Doug said, it's an imperfect world. Uh, we're, we're all flawed individuals. There are some mistakes that are made. It is a factor in the decision-making process. Uh, it's also a factor whether it was repetitive or not uh, that certainly lends itself to whether it was intentional or unintentional. So uh, that's a degree. And the degree of harm. I mean, the level of cost in the profession that we're in, uh, personal injury, property damage, and the all-important impact on the public confidence and trust. And, and then overall, of course, the employees overall past corrective history, uh, both specific to the type of policy violation that we're talking about, but overall policy violations in, in totality, I guess, is the point of it. Okay, so again, we're continuing through. Um, for in-bureau corrective actions, which means at the uh, police department, we've, we've gone through the organization chart, so you know that there's the, the Field Operations Bureau, the Criminal Investigative Bureau, um, and the Community Outreach Bureau, and then the Executive Bureau, which is the front office. So those bureau commanders have are in charge and run the day-to-day -day operations, and uh, a lot of the uh, investigations that we do at for uh, lower-level policy infractions, begin in bureau um, and go up through the, uh, the chain of command for uh, corrective action. Now, and it's important, Doug talked a lot about the CPOS thing about due process. We've talked about it in other settings, but this is part of that too. And why due process is so important beyond the fact that it's, it's constitutionally guaranteed is that when you get to the point, if you advance to the point where you have an employee termination, I can tell you my experience is the documentation, the consistency, the, the, the documentation of all of the progressive steps of the discipline becomes very important as to whether that final termination is upheld or, or whether it's not. So that's why it's important. So the, the recommended action must be reasonable, impartial, and consistent. Um, in order to do that, we have a checks and balancing system of the chain of command. The field supervisor level, which is generally the sergeant, is the initiation of most of the discipline because they're out in the, or the corrective action because they're out in the street and they witness it. it but it does go all the way up the chain of command uh, to include the senior command staff, the bureau chiefs, and or the chief of police um, before that the uh, corrective action is actually f completely finalized and then actually served to the employee. So there's a great deal of discussion and uh, experience and knowledge that's brought in to these corrective actions because you only get one chance to put them together and the documentation, as you'll hear me say over and over again, is very important. Citizen complaints of police misconduct um, or inappropriate behavior, and that's on duty or off duty, and, and that's this is what dovetails in to a, a lot of what Kansas Sea Post was talking about, but I, I think it's an interesting piece for the public to know that the law enforcement career field, specifically the Topeka Police Department employees, has a great deal of personnel rules of conduct that apply to your off-duty conduct as well as your on-duty conduct because your off-duty conduct can be cause the agency and your professional reputation to be hurt, uh, and that's a little bit different than a lot of other career fields, and I think that's one of the things that is not so well known. But as it comes to citizen complaints of misconduct or inappropriate behavior, that can be a complaint against an officer for off-duty conduct as well. Uh, any of those uh, that come through that, that particular avenue, um, and in here in Topeka we also have the uh, independent police auditor that can be the starting point for a citizen complaint as well. Those all come through uh, the in and are investigated by the professional standards unit. The uh, Professional Standards Unit an Administrative Investigation requires Chief of Police approval. That's for two reasons. Obviously, the, the Chief of Police is, is at the top of the agency, but it's also a knowledge base uh, for accountability that the 
the, the head person in charge is aware of all of the professional standards investigations, and he's aware of them from the beginning um, through the entirety of the process. So those are obviously the more serious level of alleged misconduct or performance. And again, that is on duty or off duty uh, for, for law enforcement here in, in the capital city. Next paragraph or next slide, okay. A um, little bit of a discussion here on this slide about some of the nuances. We have informal or alternative supervisory correction example. Um, and, and this is one of the things that we, we don't often talk about. In corrective action, you know, that can be positive reinforcement activities too. It's not always, you know, you, you got in trouble, you messed up something, here you go. It can also be, hey, you did a really good job. Um, I think we've all worked for bosses. If, if the only time they see the bosses is when there was something that went off the rails and something you messed up instead of the things that you did good, um, you know, I think in a modern managerial setting, we, we have to be very aware of that and, and probably should have always been aware of that. I know I appreciated uh, all the bosses that I worked for over the years who, who acknowledged some of the good stuff, and it made some of the mistakes that you made when you, when you got called on the carpet a little bit easier too. So I wanted to throw that on here. Uh, it's not always you're in trouble. It's a, well, here's how you did a great job there and, and let's continue that kind of good work. We also have the ability in the informal network of the uh, corrective action to have teaching moments or coaching moments uh, where we talk about, you know, this is how we could have done this better. Uh, here's a reminder about the policy requirements for this particular area. Uh, and and th this is one of those examples I would say. A newer officer, he's late to roll call. Um, and the roll call requirement when he's there, his sergeant talks to him, and this is a hypothetical example, but it, it actually occurred to me when I was a new sergeant, it was a newer officer, and I had a conversation with him about why he was late to roll call and found out that he was having trouble getting his gear on. He wasn't <laughs> as proficient with that in the very beginning, and so he needed to allot some more time. So that, that's a somewhat funny example, but you know, we talked about, hey, that's ultimately your responsibility. You still have to be here on time. So if you need an extra 30 minutes to get your belt and stuff on, then you need to be here to do that. And so I, I would tell you that's, a, that's what I, I talk about with the teaching moment because there are some, you know, minor infractions that we can deal with, uh, with as human beings, communication to communication, but still in part that the fact that the standard is there. You can't continue to be late for roll call. This is a, a consistent, fair, equitable standard that we have for all of our employees. So. And if you handle, handle it correctly, that can be a uh, rapport and relationship building piece, which is pretty important for a manager, even back in, in those days when I was a sergeant. So uh, we use the term coaching session, and a coaching session is a little bit more planned discussion between the employee. It has a little bit more serious feel to it, and you go over a specific action and the fact that they need to progress. One of the best examples on this one is if you identify an employee, a relatively new employee, whose quality of report writing is not, from, from even a grammatical standpoint, is not what it needs to be, or from a, a more experienced standpoint, the details of it aren't what they need to be for investigation and prosecution to follow up on. That is an example that I've had uh, as a sergeant and a lieutenant too, where you sit down in a more formalized setting it's not just a passing conversation about, hey, you need to be here earlier if you need to get your gear on. It's a, in my office, let's talk about that. Let's have some examples of your reports and specifically point to how we need to do better. And let's put a plan together, whether it's, hey, the next time you get this calls, let's you and I meet in the parking lot. Let's talk through your report um, because obviously they type their reports now in the, in the cars. So that's an example of that. Uh, when we identify a, a more serious problem that, that is a training issue, and it, it could just be like what I talked about, too. If we have somebody that needs help with report, report writing, we can certainly know who the uh, better report writers are in our, in our agency and, and pair those up and, and give them some guidance in regards to that, too. So training or retraining is, is a piece of the informal process we use, too. <clears throat> um, for serious issues or more serious issues like financial counseling, family counseling, um, as you heard me say before, you know, we are people, and so we have the employee assistance program, um, and, and we have, that's part of our informal process. If we are going through a performance-related issue and uh, we identify through our conversation um, some additional stressors in your personal life, your fan financial crisis or whatever, we can refer you through that as well. Um, and, okay, the last thing I had on the informal piece to talk about is, is specifically a policy advisory. Um, 
if you're re- if you're late for court, uh, or you are a no show at court because you forgot, or or something like that, the principles that I was talking on the last slide, you know, has this happened before? Was it intentional? You know, and the level of damage, it, and from a court perspective, if you miss court, they were able to continue it. You for, it was it was on you. You took responsibility for it. A policy advisory is a formalized memorandum that explains that the policy in this example that you are required to be at court under the subpoena notice date and time under this policy for court time which is what it is and you formalize that and what it does the you go over it with the employee you go over it with the policy it's all written down as to what it is you sign the memo they sign the memo you keep that in your supervisor bureau file and as long as they don't have a repeat performance within that year of that similar type infraction, then you don't move to the next step of formalized, which is actually a write-up. Um, but that is only used for, I, I was looking through this whole presentation to talk about minor infractions. I, I, I don't know what the word is better than that, but um, lesser infractions, I guess. Uh, first time, no similar conduct repetitive over and over again. <coughs> uh, we talked about some of the things that we've talked about before. That have come up i want to spend a little bit more time talking about uh, the performance Im- improvement plan um, this became a, a little bit of a conversation um, in regards to the the contract and and when we were discussing evaluations and etc um, so what we use is we a below expectation is in quotes uh, evaluation we have annual evaluations that occur on our personnel if you receive a below expectation and they're also the points of when you're going through your initial training phase, um, you have evaluations that go through all the time on a weekly basis with your training officer, but they culminate in a off probation evaluation, which is 18 months. If you, if you were to get a below expectation on that, you would then move into a performance imp- improvement plan. If you were a more experienced employee and on one of your annual, your yearly uh, reviews, you got a below expectation evaluation, that would trigger a performance improvement plan um, evaluation. I also, as the chief of police for cause, and, and that is defined as articulable reasons, uh, I can request a, uh, a performance improvement plan too. Um, and those can be for a v- variety of factors that are kind of more along the lines of what we were talking about with the employee assistance program. If we, we got it to a performance decline that we noticed that was in between the yearly evaluations, um, because there are quarterly expectation meetings that your supervisor has bef- so that we have some way to check employees except for just the one time at the end of the year. Right. If we got into a performance decline that was notable for an experienced officer that we thought was involved in some uh, family pressures or some financial pressure, something off duty, then we could, we could I have the ability and the authority to, to call for a performance improvement plan specific to those issues too and not have to wait for an actual annual evaluation, but the below expectation evaluation is the uh, most common trigger for that. <coughs> if we have a performance improvement plan, um, you get 520 work hours is allotted. You have an aligned out impl- improvement plan that is very much specific to the individual employee and the individual employee deficiencies that have been identified. In other words, you tailor made the program um, t- that encompasses training, policy review. Uh, repetition practices can be placing them with um, other peer officers who are good in these areas. It is not really limited by the creativity of the supervisors, but those are some general rules uh, with all of the guidelines being to support, nurture, and promote that employee's expectation level of work product into a more uh, meets expectation category. Failure to improve during that allotted time after you've triggered this performance improvement plan can result in a a termination of employment. It also can, um, with consultation with the Human Resources Department Director, there are some instances where extensions can be granted to continue to work with an employee that uh, we believe can get there to the meets expectation standard at some point. So everything's very specific. Uh, again, now we'll move through. That was kind of the informal, the different categories of the informal corrective action that we have. Um, this is the more formal. I feel like I've been talking a lot lately, so <laughs> my, my throat is, is uh, okay. So the first defense level 
Um, and these things are very specific, both in the policy uh, um, and in some degrees the steps in the collective bargaining agreements that not only we have with the uh, Fraternal Order of Peace Police, which is the biggest one, but also the, uh, the Teamsters, uh, which we have some members of that in our, in our police department as well. Uh, there's some difference in the contracts, but the steps are generally the same. <clears throat> so the first offense is a caution counseling. Um, policy infraction notice lets you know, and then those things are very specific uh, as to what the incident was that occurred, what the policies that were specific subsections that were violated. So it's a very formalized, informative document because the intent of it is to let the employee know what the expectations are, reinforce it behind that, and hopefully keep the reoccurrence from occurring, but also in those instances where, where you do have repeated infractions of the same violation, it, it lays the documentation trail that you're going to need for the ultimate uh, release of that employee that's not working out because they're not meeting the expectations that are delineated in these categories. So you move through the steps, the progressive corrective action that we talked about at the beginning. Uh, the second step is a written warning, which is further written documentation for both the employee and for the managerial staff and for the human resources department. All the way up through the third step is uh, suspension days off work with no pay, and then the fourth offense can be up to and including termination of employment. And I think it's important for note on this slide, you have to talk, when you're talking personnel matters, you, you have to talk case by case specifics because specifics matter. In other words, there are circumstances where when you can articulate cause for doing it, you jump the steps. These are just the specific steps in the order that they normally occur. But if there's a severity of the encounter, there's articulable facts that can be made to jump steps. Those are the things that, uh, that can be done. So that's what I wanted to emphasize on this slide. Is these are the normal steps through the process, but it is a very much a case-by-case -case basis uh, for what, what step we choose. Other things for for the public and for the, the council members to know, the committee members to know. Copies of all the corrective, document doc, corrective action documents are required to be provided to the employee. Um, that's an accountability issue uh, so that they know and can have no doubt that they were made aware of what the specifics were. And to the official personnel file that is kept in the City of Topeka Human Resources Office. Uh, general questions, we get a lot of questions about suspension days. They can go anywhere from one to 15 days. <clears throat> Anything more significant than 15 days, um, in my experience, is, is you're talking another, the next level of termination. It's, it's not, a, uh, not a frequent occurrence. But this goes through the level of the rank structure and what they can do. Sergeants can go up to three days on their own. This is on their own authority. Uh, lieutenants have authority to go to five, captains 10, majors up to 15, and of course the deputy chief and the chief can, can do any amount of suspension and or uh, termination requests, and we'll go through the termination processes here in a minute, depending on how much time we do. So, senior staff approve all those, like I talked before. So, when we're talking about m lesser infractions, those are still reviewed all the way up the chain of command for corrective action before they're served to the employee. These suspension days are absolutely make it all the way up to the chief's office um, to be reviewed because they need. To, there's a situational awareness aspect of, of the front office knowing about suspension days as well um, because those are generally either reoccurring infractions of a similar nature which can identify the problem uh, a problem employee and we need to make sure that or an employee with with challenges in certain areas we need to make sure that we're supporting that employee um, through their growth correctly or taking the other appropriate actions so that's why that's on there um, at the end of the day the chief of police has final authority and responsibility uh, for all Department of Corrective Actions. Um, and in the grievance appeal process for these various steps as outlined in the uh, collective bargaining agreement, in general terms, seven days of each step of the receipt of the grievance process is what has to take place for answers for them to proceed. And uh, that's a process that we do a lot with the Human Resources Department. Chief, Chief, can we stop right here? Um, can we go back? Um back one slide you you let us know when you see what which one you're talking about madam chairwoman no no the last slide there we go um 
and then I'm going to make that a stopping point. We're going to have to. Um, so um, on their corrective documents, does the employee sign those documents when they get it? Yeah, yes, they do. And uh, the issuing supervisor or commander does as well. And when they come through the uh, chief of police's office, uh, they're initialed. And that's, of course, prior to the service as they go through the review process. But when they're actually served to the employee, the employee signs and the supervisor signs. And in some cases where there's FOP, Fraternal Order of Police representation, they sign the document as well. Okay, I just want to, I just, it didn't say that and I wanted to make sure. Uh, council members, it's almost five o'clock. Does anybody else have any, um, any questions? Uh, we'll pick up on this on the next meeting, but does anybody have any questions at this point? I've got, I've, um, Madam Chair, I've got three quick ones, but I can wait. Uh, it's, it's up to you. If you don't want to wait, we can, we can ask some questions. I think, these, I, just, I think he can answer these pretty quickly. Okay, Get, go ahead. Getting back to the complaint piece, when uh, complaints are received, um, how quickly are the complainants advised of the status of their complaint. Let's say I bring in something, how quickly do I know what's being done with that complaint? When we take that initial complaint, we, we try to talk, the professional standards unit or, or the supervisor tries to talk in regards to what could be the expected progression of that. Um, but they aren't really advised of the outcome until the outcome is achieved, I guess, is that. So we try to let set the expectation level for, for how long this might take. But as soon as the investigation is completed, then they are received notice. And we certainly have instances where we give them feedback along the way. And, and oftentimes, one of the steps that they have to do is come in and provide a statement or, or additional information. So I feel like they're in the process from the beginning all the way through the end. OK, good. So I would timely, at least, in, in, internally. You maybe say you've got X amount of days, weeks, whatever. Yeah, I, I would. I feel very confident in telling you that my staff knows that my expectation is is I want a thorough investigation done, but a, a timely, responsive manner is every bit as important. Okay. The other thing is on policies. When you have updated policies, I know they come out periodically. How are the officers? How are they? These new policies uh, disseminated to the officers, and do they have to acknowledge receipt of that change? So they are updated, so there can't be any confusion as to what it used to be and but what it is now. Yes, absolutely. The, uh, the internal workings of all the policy adaptations are, are tracked through Power DMS, which is an electronic uh -huh. piece that we have. And the officers are given a, a period of time. It's usually seven to 10 days, depending on the length of the policy, from the time they receive an email that says there's a new policy in Power DMS for you to review. They go to that policy within the time frame and review it. At the end of it, after they've reviewed it, they have to sign off that says that they acknowledge that they've understood the policy piece and, and it gives a date and tracking. So at any time, I can log in to that, look at a specific policy, tell, tell you who hasn't hit the timeline. We get flag notifications that go to their supervisors to say, hey, you need to do it. And I'm a, I'm a chief who's very much a stickler about it because I go through and do audits and reviews and send people notices and said, hey, you, you need to get this done for this time frame. But when they actually review it, they are required to sign that they understand it. And that is part of the documentation. So it's a great question to ask because that is part of the documentation that we provide on some of the, the uh, larger infractions is the dates and time pieces from that database that we have that shows when they signed the new adaptation and when they were aware of it. Yeah, I'm familiar with that Power DMS. We used it at State as well, but that's a good way to track very accountable. Yeah. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I've got a comment and a question, and they can keep, but I'd just as soon be able to at least put them on the table before we go. Put it on the table, okay. Councilwoman. Chief and I have talked at some length about the issue that came up during negotiations and otherwise about suspension without pay. And um, it sounds like our policy is pretty clear, but administrative, administratively what has happened apparently on some occasions is that those individuals have been allowed to take vacation instead and say that it was vacation instead of their suspension. And I think you lose, it sounds to me like you lose a lot of the intent of that policy if you do that. So I'd, next time around, if, if that's what it is, some more conversation about that. Um, 
I, a lot I of us are surprised yeah. about that issue anyway that that suspension without pay occurs i think between us we kind of figured out why it happens right. but um i'm uncomfortable with vacation being um learning that vacation is used as an alternative um the other question that i had because i think she's going to make us go home um is is Chief mentioned, and we'd heard before, that all of these items go all the way up the chain of command. And I was curious about how many steps that means some of these things take, and therefore how much time of, of our department, and why it needs to go, and whether there might be a way to expedite that. And I'm coming from that in terms of both a management point of view, is it necessary, but also looking at how much time that might take, because I don't know how many of these we have. So for, for future, but those were the two questions I had. Thank you. Okay, Chief, uh, you got those questions. We'll start out next um, at our next meeting with those questions. Um, okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, good meeting, everybody. Um, and uh, this meeting is adjourned. Go home. Have a good weekend. Go home. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good Thank weekend. You. Thank you. Go home. <laughs>